Well, again, welcome, everybody. Special welcome to those who are participating at home as well, but welcome to Lent. Welcome to Lent. Whenever natural disasters occur around the world, it's not uncommon for people to refer to them in terms of, quote-unquote, biblical proportions. Right? A flood, a hurricane, a blizzard, an earthquake, a drought of biblical proportions, we say. Of course, in the Bible itself, especially in the Old Testament, the writers were simply recording their own experiences of natural disasters and trying to make some sense out of them. For instance, the story about Noah and the flood that we heard in our first reading today is a, a good example of that. Now, a lot of people today, it's true, they don't recognize God's presence in our world. In fact, they'll do anything necessary to try and explain him away or to keep any mention of him out of our public discussions. Not so in biblical times. Not so. They went to the other extreme. They saw God's hand in everything, good and bad alike. And so that meant they were always looking for signs that would help them understand what was going on in their lives and going on in the world around them. For example, for the people of old, as we heard in our first reading again, the beauty of a rainbow after a storm, well, that was a sign of hope for the future. It symbolized a renewal of their covenant with God. While the flood had symbolized how they believed that he was fed up with their bad behavior, fed up with their sins. Now, of course, we know now that things aren't quite that black and white. You know, natural disasters are just a reminder that we live in a very imperfect world, a very finite world. They're not an indication that God is giving up on us or that he's trying to wipe us out or that he's fed up with our behavior. But that is the simple way that they saw things back in Old Testament times. So again, some people today, they don't see God in anything. But back then, they saw him in all things. Now, before the story of Noah and the flood, the story of the fall of Adam and Eve gives us a great illustration of just how our relationship with God has gotten off track. As you know, we call Adam and Eve's decision to turn their back on God and to go their own way the quote-unquote original sin. And every one of us, every human being ever since, has suffered the consequences of that. Because of that original sin, because humanity at one point said, thanks, Lord, but no, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to ignore your commandments. Thanks to that, our world is far, far from the Garden of Eden now, isn't it? It really is. And all of us are, in a sense, stained by that original sin, which means, in other words, we are very imperfect human beings, and we're born that way. Everything about us is imperfect. Our hearts, our minds, our wills, our memories, everything. And we're born into a very imperfect world. Still beautiful, but imperfect nonetheless. At a baptism that I attended many years ago when I was a seminarian, I heard a priest explain original sin this way. He said to the new mom and dad, he said, you know, when your baby boy is finally old enough for the first time to stamp his foot and say, no, I will not, then you'll know that original sin is real. You'll know that it exists. You know, attending a baby's baptism gives us adults a great opportunity to reflect on our own baptism and how it's influenced our lives, or not influenced it, as it were. It was on our baptism day that Christ gave us the promise of eternal life. And then later, it's up to us to accept that promise, to accept that gift, to show whom we want that eternal life by how we choose to live our lives. St. Peter tries to show us that connection in our second reading today when he said this, God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few persons were saved through water, literally saved through the waters of the flood, right? St. Peter goes on, this prefigured baptism which saves you now. In other words, Peter is saying this, that as dramatic as the saving of Noah and his family was through the waters of the flood, that is nothing compared with the drama of how you and I are saved through the waters of baptism. Jesus entered our very imperfect world, 
our very damaged world, and he didn't give in to the temptations of Satan, the temptations of the world, the temptations of the flesh. Instead, he saved us through his cross and resurrection, and now he shares that saving, that salvation with us through the sacrament of baptism. Of course, for, for various reasons, there's a great temptation in Lent to focus only on our imperfections, only on our sins and our struggles and our failures. And yes, that should be an important part of what we do during this season. But only a part, only a part. It's probably best if we don't stop our personal reflections there, just reflect on how I failed. No, it'd be a little more fruitful for us if, yes, we first accept the fact that we're weak, that we're sinful, that we're imperfect human beings, born into an imperfect world, but then to also go on to joyfully renew our faith in the meaning of our baptism. Because it's through our baptism that we entered into a whole new relationship with Christ our Redeemer. The same Christ who went into the desert and stood up to the powers of evil and began to heal all the hurts that our sins have caused in this world. In other words, when Easter comes, we'll be better followers of Christ if, again, yes, we first acknowledge the power of sin in our lives and do something about that, chiefly going to confession, but then if we also, during Lent, renew our faith in the power of Jesus Christ and in the power of our baptism, which has overcome those sins. You might remember that on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the glory of Jesus' resurrection in part by renewing our baptismal promises. So we have that series of questions that were asked and we respond with a confident, I do, to every one of those questions. And that's an amazing expression of our faith as we renounce Satan and evil and sin and then profess our faith in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Catholic faith that they've given us. So one thing that might give some added meaning to our Lent this year is to try and find some time to also look at the meaning of our baptism and to see if we are really, truly allowing it to shape our lives, to shape who we are, to shape how we treat one another. And if we're parents or godparents, maybe we could also ask ourselves just how seriously we've taken our vows to ensure that the children who are entrusted to us are growing to appreciate the meaning of their baptism and the faith they were given that day and their own relationship with Christ. And if we haven't made the best efforts in that regard yet, it's not too late. It's never too late. But if we spend our Lent reflecting on those things too, not only on our personal failings, not only on our sins, but also on the healing power of Christ and the power of our baptism, then on Easter Sunday, when we say, I do, to each one of those questions, our voices will be filled with real conviction and real joy and real hope.